Almighty God, we thank you for your mercy and your goodness towards us as we continue to strive to learn more about you, your character, and the nature of your kingdom, that we might reflect heaven on earth with its full glory. As we continue to go through our reviews, may these things that you teach us settle into our hearts and into our minds that our desires would be renewed and restrengthened and refreshed each day to press on towards the goal of this high calling. We ask you to be with us as we continue our study throughout the Sabbath day. That we would grow in wisdom, courage, humility, and faith. We praise you and thank you for the blessed opportunity to be here and pray to purpose in our hearts to be determined to endure till the end. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's make sure the board is where you can all see it. Give me just a second to. Almost for you. You can see it other than I need to tip it up, right? Can you read it okay? Everybody can read it okay? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So this picks up where Francisco left off um, last night. And this one is identifying the threat from the Brazil camp meeting. Um, that she's working her way towards, but has not really gone through yet the document, how the constitution became a Christian. She makes the point that the document itself is not our template, but what rather is our template. What did the midnight cry give us? Feminism? The streams of information. All good answers. Not quite the right one yet. I need to turn my volume. Hello. Streams of information. That is that is one of the, that is the main thing that the midnight cry gave us. But in context of what we're studying in these last few studies, what did the midnight cry give us? Anybody on the board, if that helps. Gender? What? Gender? Gender? No. What we have here? Restructures. Restructures. So who wants to review the three structures, what they are? The, um, there's modern Israel, there's um, the counterfeit and God we trust. What is the, yeah, God we trust. Okay. Yep. So you have modern Israel, which represents Adventism, which is the, um, you're going to have the Alpha and the um, Omega, the counterfeit, which is represented by the papacy, and then in God we trust, which is um, teaching us about Protestantism. So you have Adventism, Catholicism, and Protestantism, and God is teaching us through each of these structures. So each one covers um, a history that begins at the time of the end. Right? And we see that there is two histories of failure, failure, and then a history of success in each one of these structures, in each one of these um, in Adventism, Catholicism, and Protestantism. So they're they follow a similar pattern all the way through. 
And um, I don't remember. Yeah, I did draw this one on here. Okay. So, and what she said then is that it is Protestantism that um, enacts the Sunday law. But what we've been learning more of, and just to briefly put it up here, that if this was the right wing, right? And this is the left wing that Protestantism just represents a little bit here, if we remember that. So you've got all the rest of this, of the, of the right wing. Okay, so, so, um, so what this one said is that the Protestantism and the Sunday law, how do we understand that today? Well, basically what I just put there, I mean, this is just where we were at at this point in time. So the increase of knowledge is the template um, that is being used is the Sunday law template. So the increase of knowledge, we have our 144,000 line, where you 1989, 9-11, Sunday law, close of probation, and the second advent. And then what way mark was this? 2019. 2019. So our increase of knowledge was given to us on the Sunday law in 2019. And we continue to go through and then this would be 2021, which is what? Formalization. Not, formalization, yeah. And I'm not able to, I have really bad eyes to go back and forth to the chat. So <laughs> and maybe if somebody wants to read the chat now and then, that would be really helpful. Um, so you feel free to speak out or somebody read the chat. Maybe Christine can focus on reading the chat for me as we go along, if you don't okay. mind. Is that okay? Yes, yes. That would help me because I really struggle to focus going back and forth. Okay, so the document, How the Constitution Became Christian, um, helps add info to the structures and also gives us, um, helps to guide us along through. And that as we go through that document, it'll continue to give us more and more context as well. So we went through last night what um, Francisco started with. You had the first and second great awakening which was Calvinism, the conservative side of Calvinism and the new school, the new side liberal or the liberal side of Calvinism. Okay, so, so what we want to understand from the document, how the constitution became Christian is um, who we want to understand that there will be a Sunday law, why there will be, where it'll come from, who's going to enact it and what it'll be about. And that these studies that we're working on and especially as we go now into Vespers, um, or helping to clarify all of the all of the issues when it comes to the Sunday law. So calling it the increase of knowledge and the formalization, and we are in here now um, and growing to better understand. So back at this time, which was 2021, early 2021, um, still saying that it's Protestantism, but what we're learning in Vesper is that Protestantism, that's kind of a poor writing of it, I think hopefully you follow that. Protestantism is just a part of the Sunday law. Okay, so I'm going to read a quote, Review and Herald, December 24th, 1889, that is paragraph one, and then we'll go through and break it down. Um, I have been much burdened in regard to the movements that are now in progress for the enforcement of Sunday observance. It has been shown to me that Satan has been working earnestly to carry out his designs to restrict religious liberty. Plan of serious import to the people of God are advancing in an underhand manner among the clergymen of various denominations. And the object of this secret maneuvering is to win popular favor for the enforcement of Sunday sacredness. If the people can be led to favor a Sunday law, then the clergy intend to exert their united influence to obtain a religious amendment to the constitution and compel the nation to keep Sunday. So that was Review and Herald, December 24th, 1889. So the point made in 2019 um, is that Ellen White, Ellen White is standing here that we understood in 2019. She's standing here when she said what? What did she say in this? Um, in this first paragraph, these movements, what about these movements?
They want to enact the Sunday law? Yeah, they want to enact the Sunday law, but these movements are now in progress, right? So these movements are now in progress. This is 1889 when she says it, right? We have in here the 1888 history as well. So she's saying that these movements are now in progress. Um, and this is the, the first history, and it's a history of failure for both Adventism and Protestantism. So the history of the first movement, the work is um, in progress. And then 130 days, 130 years ago, she said that will lead to the National Sunday Law. So now in progress, this was 130 years ago, saying that this is going to lead to the National Sunday Law. Okay, so the second sentence, Satan has been working is working to bring about this about plans are being advanced through various Protestant denominations. Um, it just kind of in parentheses, the secrecy can be misunderstood um, because these things were not invisible. If you look at our history now, we can see these things as our as we have grown and our eyes have opened, we can see these things. So these things were actually happening back here that they could see, but what were they not looking at in the Ellen White history? What was their focus? Looking at the external events. Yeah, back in this history, not looking at external events and in this history. So so um so it wasn't really in secret. And plus in this history, maybe somebody remembers that that joined that was with us in our studies quite a while back. We went through a few documents. Anybody remember some of the documents that we went through? We're talking about amending the Constitution. When the Constitution became Christian? Yeah, and I can't remember if that's the title. That might be the title of it. I, I didn't write down the title of it, but who, what, who was the writer? Who, who wrote that? Is it Goldstein? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, you know, not, not that one. Not how the Constitution became Christian. Sorry. Um, talking internally, who was... A.T. Jones. A.T. Jones, right? Um, and I can't remember the name of the document, but he was writing about that, that whole issue of um, wanting to amend the Constitution um, and enact the Sunday Law, right? So in this history, it wasn't like people couldn't see what was happening. They saw the Blair Bill. They saw all the things that were happening in, each, in, the, in that history. So um, in, in the last sentence to that paragraph, if the people can be led to favor a Sunday Law, then the clergy intend to exert their united influence to obtain a religious amendment to the Constitution and compel the nation to keep Sunday, right? So in this history, they want to get people to favor a Sunday law, and then the clergy intend to exert their influence to obtain a religious amendment, so it's internal that wants to, the religious aspect that wants to amend the Constitution and compel the nation to keep Sunday. So what's the problem with that sentence? It, uh, it was a failure? Yeah, there was a failure. Um, let's go back to the beginning of the paragraph. The movements that are now in progress was 130 years ago. Right? And they want to amend the Constitution. No. Are they trying to amend the Constitution? Are they trying to amend the Constitution? No. Not now. Okay. We're just interpreted it right. differently. Correct. So those movements that were now in progress are now dead here, right? Back here, the, the Constitution was viewed as what? Godless. Um, Godless, a pagan document. And how do we view, how, does, how is the Constitution viewed here? Christian. Christian. So back here, they saw it as godless and needs to be amended. And here they see it as already Christian, based on what? Their interpretation. Their interpretation. So there's no need to amend it in this history. So these movements are dead. So, um, and the document, how the Constitution became Christian, 
is going to take us through these histories to show us show us how that can be. They're back here, they want to amend the constitution and how do we get to here, okay? So with that being said, she says these movements are now in progress and they're dead now. What do we do with Ellen White's writings? We're reinterpreting them. How? In our own thoughts. <laughs> what in our own thoughts apply apply them apply them to our time correct methodology there you go you're all good the correct methodology so we're going to read them together through strict perfect methodology using these structures all these structures that god has given us so we know we no longer want to amend the constitution and there's a change from where she stood to where we stand now what would you call that where she is here to where we are now what would you call that change looking forward um, susan and mary say dispensational we'll keep going we'll come up with the right those are those are i don't know if this, yeah dispensational would be okay but that's not the, quite the word but we'll see it as we go through it um, we'll see it as we as we go through it. So we know that we no longer want to amend the Constitution. There's a change from where we stood to where she stood to where we are now. And in the 40s and 50s, you saw that there was a mixture between amending and interpreting the Constitution. And in our our history, Bell said it. It's in, based on interpretation. It was you, right, Bell? I think it was Bell. I don't want to say the wrong person. I think it was Bell. Okay. Yes. Okay, so what she said no longer applies. These movements now, and they're wanting to enact the Sunday law and wanting to amend the Constitution. These, these no longer, what she said no longer applies. So the Constitution transformed. This is the word that I was looking for. So there was a transformation. And the document, How the Constitution Became Christian, walks us through these histories to where we can see this transformation. And we saw that each of these histories has a similar pattern. We're gonna look at that as well. So tracing the course, um, tracking this course brings clarity on the issue. So you have the movements that are then in progress, movements that are in progress and now in progress and how the docu that document will help us to understand this transformation because what we needed to see was a transformation because those movements to amend the constitution and enact the Sunday law are not here um, in progress. So we needed to see a transformation. Okay, so we looked at first and saw this some of this last night with the first great awakening and say, anybody remember the key figure in the first great awakening? Back here, old school news site. Anybody remember the key figure, the key person? Is it Finney? That would be here, I believe. Who was here? You said Jedediah Morris versus William Bentley? No, that would be here, I believe, as well, too. White, White Peel. Peel. White Peel. Yeah. 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 Um, I was going to say Whitfield. Is it Whitefield? Whitfield, Whitefield. Okay. So George, George. No, it's Whitfield. Whitfield, okay. Yeah. That was the old side versus the new side. And it was a fight before, between the more strict Calvinism and the more liberal views of Calvinism, the soul side versus, so you've got this strict Calvinism back in here off the board, and now you've got this new, more liberal side of Calvinism that is, there's now this conflict between um, the two factions of Calvinism. So conservatives called the liberals what? Anybody remember what the conservatives called the liberals? Liberals come in and they start holding their camp meetings. Emotionalism. Emotionalism, is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, emotionalism. They started to use emotionalism in their revivals. The second great awakening, who was the key figure here? You guys had him? Charles Finney. 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 And you had a similar issue again. You had the old school versus the new school, this old conservative versus the liberal theological fight over Calvinism again, right? 
So it was insane as the first great awakening, especially when it comes to doctrines such as predestination that no longer fit their Republican view as an American citizen. The conservatives accused liberal revivalists of using emotionalism. So you see the two streams develop through Protestantism. They find their base in different universities. We saw that Yale switched from a conservative to a liberal university early on. And that's why you see many Republicans and conservatives today attack universities. Universities are secular and they're destroying um, destroying religion in, in people. So, um, and Adventist, Adventism also had similar views, but you can trace much of it back to these universities that stood through the Great Awakenings. Princeton became a bulwark of conservatism, fundamentalist conservative, conservatism and Calvinism. So Princeton um, was the bulwark of conservatism. So who remembers who was over Princeton, in charge of Princeton? Charles Hodge. Hodge is correct. A. A. Hodge, I don't know what A. A. stands for, but A. 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 Hodge. So close enough, I think. So we traced Calvinism through the Covenanters, and we went through those studies as well. And what did what did A. A. Hodge say about um, about Princeton and their seminary? Nothing new came out of there. Right. Nothing new came out of there. So he's boasting them conserving their way, their old ways. Whereas you have this new side, new school, um, we're in this history now, this new school of liberal, liberal Calvinism rising up. Um, and Hodge is boasting that there's nothing new that came out of here. And if we took that and looked at it from what we've learned down here, where would we be if we learned nothing new? Would we be ready for Jesus to return? We would be old school, we would be conservative, we would be on the wrong side of the issue. Right, right. So it's necessary to learn and progress, right? Yes. So conservatism in its most literal sense completely rejects any concept of progression or restoration. If you reject what we teach about progression, you have to agree with Hodge when he says the following. This is A. Hey Hodge again. And if Christ is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, if he is really the ruler among the nations, then all nations are in the highest sense one nation under one king, one law, having one interest and one end. There cannot be two laws for Christians, one to govern the relations of individuals and the other, the relations of nations. So what is he saying there? And we all must be ruled under, under Christ. Right, individually and as a nation together. So you can't have one law that says Christians keep the Sabbath, which for them was Sunday, and not have an impact on the national state law. You can't separate the two. One nation under one king, one law, not separate laws for individuals and then state laws. So Hodge says that you have to have one law that is over individuals and the nation as well, which what does that mean? You talking about Sabbath, what does that mean? Sunday? Yeah. Um, politically, what, is it, what does it look like? If that's the right way to ask that. What does it look like politically then? If the yeah, name... Mary, Mary said union, union of church and state. Yes, union of church and state. So, um, so there's no separation between church and state in that view. Calvinism, the doctrine of the covenanters, the old side, the old school thinking, which was fed through the Princeton Seminary, it was the first and second great awakenings were rebellions against, against that. So the, they were rebellions against the, the, the separation of church and state. So the Protestant hierarchy hated the great awakenings. Why? So you got old side versus new side. This 
liberal versus conservative, liberal versus conservative. Why did the high, why did Protestant hierarchy hate these awakenings? He kept on bringing bringing in liberal views, and and it and it uh, degraded their authority. I did read one. David's got it. Um, I'm trying to watch it. Come. David says losing power. Yeah, losing and power. Susan said threatened their power. Threatened their power. So it's about power. So the ministers taught the people. The ministers of the new school are teaching the people to free themselves from the hierarchy, like a revolution. So the hierarchy starts to lose power, and then it becomes a fight over power. So the awakening started to pull away from the more orthodox Calvinism. So, the example, it's 1840. A message comes that cuts away. It comes that cuts away orthodox Calvinism. Requires you to be willing to sever yourself from your denominational hierarchy, to listen and follow a bunch of nobodies in the church system and to think and reason for yourself. Can you do that if you sided with the old school? No. No, why? No new ideas. No new ideas. So you, so if you're a part of the new school, um, let me see if I say that right. The new school is separating from the hierarchy, but you can't do that from here. You can't think and reason for yourself because you're going to follow and hold on to the hierarchy. Susan says you must conform. Right. Correct. So, um, no, the fight separate to the Millerites was, when you come into this, his, into this history here with the Millerites, was will you at all costs cling to your denominational leaders, those influential men, are you willing to think for yourself and sever from them? So you've got New School and then you've got the Millerites in here. Are you willing to separate yourself from them? People who sided with Calvinism in the old school had already made their decision. So if you're here, then and you don't you don't choose the new school, which is pulling you away from the hierarchy to have you think and reason for yourself. If you're here, can you become a Millerite? You're in the old school? In the old school. No. No. So in this history here, then they, the old school, they had already made their decision. Think about that as you think about the. This, why didn't I left it open? So let's see if it will work. As we look at the, we have plowing, right? Former rain, latter rain, and harvest. This would be 89, right? So if you took that to 79, I'm sorry, um, 1798. Got my numbers all twisted in my head. Took that to 1798. So you're in this history of plowing that's preparing them, correct? In this early history. So if you don't leave the old school for the new school, you've already chosen your hierarchy. You've already chosen to stay. So your decision is already made. So everybody follows that? What would that look like here in 1989? In 1989 is when Elder Jeff right, um, began with a line upon line, right? So if you didn't come, if you didn't come on board, then you would remain in the old school. So I, I suppose 89 with Elder Jeff, that would be new school, new thoughts. And if you didn't come on board, then you would remain in the, uh, the mainstream Adventism, old school. Right. And so what you have in this history and this history, somebody said it earlier, what did the midnight cry bring us? 
besides the structures that, that I was trying to find the answer to. Two streams of information. Two streams, right? So what you have, you mentioned Elder Jeff, but Elder Jeff didn't have anything to do with the world, right? He was internal. So you have these two streams of information externally, but separate from religion that are doing this work. Does that make sense? So we have the same thing here with these two streams of information that are, you've got this um, conservative liberal um, fight and it's meant to draw people from the old school or conservatism into the liberalism to prepare them for the loud cry. So you have here these people in the old school that refuse to um, give up their hierarchy and reason for themselves. They've made their decision already. So those that sided with the Millerites felt compelled the message was the truth. In spiritual gifts, Ellen White covers that history. What are the Protestant ministers doing? If anybody remembers that story. She talks about the um, what the Protestant ministers were doing in that history. Because the Millerites felt compelled that the message was the truth. What were those Protestant ministers doing? Were they preaching the predestination? No, there's a particular passage that you talked about, and I don't have that quote in here, but you'll recognize it when I say this, that people would try to break free from their companies. Remember that? People are going to try to break free from their companies. And through vision, she could see that these ministers had been binding them together again. So no one could pull away from their denominations. So you see the, the ministers, and this would be the new school in this history here, the new school, these, um, this revival of the, of the liberal side that is, um, that is, as the messages of William Miller being preached, the ministers are finding them together to remain in this in this new school. So, so these ministers were attempting to hold on to the people and what else? We mentioned it earlier. What are they trying to hold on to? Power. Power. If you already sided with the old school in the second great awakening, if you already submitted yourself to be bound by that hierarchy, it'd be extremely difficult to separate yourself into the Millerites. So translate that to here. Susan says it kind of what Satan will do at the end. Or Susie said that. Susie said kind of what Satan will do at the end. Yeah. So we see this work going on externally, right? He says, uh, Susie says, keeping a hold of his folks. Yes. Yes. David says, praying to Satan. Yes. So mostly non-religious, um, externally, this work is taking place to, to keep people um, bound to that hierarchy. So if you're not willing to question your ancient Calvinist traditions and teachings, and this is speaking as one of them, I've been taught from a young age, my grandparents were taught, we almost universally all believe in predestination. I won't question those, the leadership. Then the message of William Miller could have none effect. It can't have an effect on those in the old school. Does everybody follow that? I think I might've mixed it up earlier, but it, you can't have an effect on those in the old school. Does that make sense? Susan says, I noticed when I left in 2019 that the leadership doubled down hard to keep people even afraid to talk to me. So she's talking about when she left SDA. She noticed that the leadership had made it even hard, harder for um, the people to talk to her. Yeah, because they're trying to hold on to those people. Right. They have to sacrifice and let one of you go. 
go ahead and get out <laughs> so that we can spare the rest of the flock. Right. Which kind of, we saw some of that at Sac Central as well. Right, exactly. And they stood up in the pulpit and named us, basically. Okay, so you needed to be pulled from conservative Calvinism and be willing to be severed from your Protestant leadership. And that work had already begun externally, really back in the 1790s. So you have 1798 being the time of the end, but she's talking about the 1790s. So prior to that work had already kind of began. What would that look like down here? In 1798, the time of the end, you have 1989, the time of the end. What would that look like down here with that work began? Are you talking about like the moral majority? Yes, I am. Okay. Yes, I am. So you had from like 79 to 89, that period mm -hmm. of time in there with the moral, right. the moral majority, right? Right. So the work had already begun before you even get to the time of the end. Okay. So then we're going to read a little section out of Life Sketches 80, 139, um, paragraph 2. My mind remained in this condition for months. This is her talking about where uh, we're going to look for where her parents are taking her. My, my mind remained in this condition for months. I had usually attended the Methodist meetings with my parents, but since becoming interested in the soon appearing of Christ, I had attended the messages on Casco Street. The following summer, my parents went to the Methodist camp meeting at Buxton, Maine, taking me with them. So where are they going? To a Methodist camp meeting, right? I was fully resolved to seek the Lord in earnest there and obtain, if possible, the pardon of my sin. There was great longing in my heart for the Christian's hope and peace that comes from of believing. So her parents are taking her where? A camp meeting. A camp meeting, which she says in here, Methodist camp meeting, that's talking about the coming of Christ. So these are meetings of the Second Great Awakening. She's going Casco Street, so we know where was she going when she went to the Casco Street. She went where? To Casco Street. The meetings, in, the camp meeting was Casco on Casco Street. Anybody oh, know then what okay. she was attending? Miller, right? Susan Miller. Miller. Yeah. So she's. So these are meetings of the Second Great Awakening, and it had both positive and negative effects. So the positive was they're on the right stream. They're in this new school here. They're on the right stream to join William Miller once they heard the message. What about had they been in the old school and they went to hear this message? What would what would we likely see? This is Ellen White, her parents taking her to the Millerite messages in this time of the second great awakening. If they were part of the old school, would there be an Ellen White? No. Probably not, right? Because we've seen that they can't make that transition. So the external streams, Ellen White and her family were in the correct stream. So they were in this stream in order to be able to come out and join the Millerites. So in our last dispensation, this is this presentation is in 2021. So the last dispensation would have been 2014 to 2019, correct? In our last dispensation, that would have been as far as we went. You had life. This was life. And this was death. The new school represents life and the old school represents death. So think about that, where that means for here and look at our dispensation of 2014 to 2019, right? It's going to be life or death. 
depending on what stream you're in. So the complication in that, um, going back to Charles Finney, what did Charles Finney say? He was a key figure in the second grade awakening, new school. What does he say? What's kind of happening with the with religion in that time? Susan's um, saying it, it's not on this. She says, I was just reading how CNN is now going through a big shakeup. So it is transforming now to um, two also, I think. I think what we're witnessing is decisions being made. Yeah. And, uh, so Charles Finney, he said that people are lazy and distracted. And he wanted to break down the laziness and the distraction. So what does he say is needed? We kind of had somebody had that answer a little bit ago. In the new school, what's now needed? What did they use? Emotionalism. Emotionalism. So you get this tidal wave of emotionalism. And this comes to the to the meetings now that Ellen White is mm. witnessing or being a part of. Right? So continuing that quote, we're in paragraph three, my sketch is 80, 139, paragraph three. Some things at this camp meeting perplexed me exceedingly. I could not understand the exercises of many persons during the conference meetings that would stand in their tent and in their tents. They shouted at the top of their voices, clapped their hands, and appeared greatly excited. Quite a number fell through exhaustion, it appeared to me. But those present said they were sanctified to God. And this wonderful manifestation was the power of the Almighty upon them after lying motionless for a time. These persons would rise again and talk and shout as before. So she's going to this to these camp meetings and seeing what kind of behavior. Uh, Susan says very erratic behavior. Right. And then further down in that passage, she talks about the people who become sick from the excitement and loss of sleep. And another place she talks about the mental illnesses that develop from the emotionalism and the fear, especially the fear. And that these were tactics that the traveling ministers used in the Second Great Awakening. The problem with that emotionalism is it's it can be temporary if you're not using your brain. Exactly. You can't reason. Uh, Susan says fear can be very debilitating. Yeah. And so what, what was the result with Ellen White? What did she experience as a result of seeing this? Well, I don't remember what it said. I would think disappointment. <laughs> Yeah, so she it caused her heartache as a young person. She's going to these meetings for what? Because she's hearing that Christ, her Lord and Savior, she's going there for seeking forgiveness for her sins. There's a difference in the mindset of the people, right? Susan, so, said they uh, rebu um, Susan says she rebukes them. I think. I, is she old enough to do that? I think she does later. I don't remember. But um, the meetings then gave her no relief, but increased her discouragement. And as this is one, this is one place where she fell into despair. If anybody remembers that, she, she falls into despair when she sees that. So I think she has a. Um, she, maybe somebody remembers who she meets with and talks with after that. I want to say Stockman. Is that the right name? Um, she falls into despair when she sees this, and then. She accepts the Millerite, the message of the Millerites. So uh, this is continuing in Life Sketches 80, 150, paragraph three. Still, I observed some of those who pretended to be sanctified, manifested a bitter spirit, 
when the subject of the soon coming of Christ was introduced, because remember, she's going there because she wants to hear these messages that Christ is soon to return, and she's seeing all this emotionalism and this erratic behavior. Um, and so the people that pretended to be sanctified manifested a bitter spirit when the subject of the soon coming of Christ was introduced. This did not seem to me a manifestation of the holiness which they professed. I could not understand why ministers from the pulpit should so oppose the doctrine that Christ's second coming was near at hand. Reformation had followed the preaching of this belief, and many of the most devoted ministers <clears throat> and laymen had received it as the truth. It seemed to me that those who sincerely loved Jesus would be ready to accept the tidings of his coming and rejoice that it was near at hand. So she's going to these meetings, and this is with um, the new school side where she's attending these. Uh, is that correct to say that she's with the, she's in the new school side, correct? Um, we're talking about Calvinism and the Methodists. Yeah. So she's in the new school side and she's, she's, disappointed in seeing and discouraged in seeing people that are not happy to hear that Christ is going to return. Susan go says, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, Susan says they didn't even want to lose their power to Christ. Yeah. They liked their, the flavor of religion that was developing and the emotionalism and the excitement and to hear that Christ was coming was not what was in their hearts. They did not care that Christ was coming. So she's observing these people who have embraced the second great awakening. Useful. She's observing them. They've given the physical manifestations of emotionalism that were required they're crying, they're clapping, they're claiming to, have, to love Jesus. Yet when they're presented with a message that says the, the same Jesus that they're in their worst claiming to worship is about to return, they manifest bitterness. Picture that here as well. When you trace the conservative liberal faction who today would this group be, right? So, uh, so they manifest bitterness that Christ is coming. Ellen White is confused. This did not seem to be the manifestation of the holiness which they professed and the majority of the people who embraced the second great awakening and embrace the second great awakening did not embrace Millerism. So they had to make this transition from the old school and the second great awakening to the new school, and then they had to move into Millerism. So you have two external streams one leads to life and one leads to death. The old school to death and the new school to life. You needed to come from the new school and become a Millerite. So if they're going to come, they're going to claim to love Jesus, and they're going to come from the new school, what do they have to now do? You got the message of the 2300 days, right? They have to be tested. So they cry that they love Jesus, they're going to be given the 2300 days for the chart and they're going to be tested on it. See that down here with equality. They cry to love equality, but they're going to be tested on it. So today, Elaine, yeah, I just want to comment that in the 1980s, 1990s, our Adventist churches, the conservative independent ministries, they had like second awakening, emotional, fear-driven camp meetings. They had a lot of those, which I attended some, and my husband also, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
So God was trying to, um, you know, rise the new school through the independent ministries in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, but not exactly to this movement, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was in the process of development. Yeah, because we did, I don't know, I think it's pretty much all of us. We, we, as Adventists, we gravitated towards independent ministry, right? Um, and yes, there, there were the sincere ones back then, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, and if you think about it, each step along the way, you know, you get a lot of people that want to embrace some of those independent ministries. But what happened when you introduced the 2520? They rejected it. <laughs> right? So that would be internally, yes, because they were rejecting it. And uh, it's very hard to teach people. So externally, though, um, this is repeated today. There's two external streams, and the world is divided. The world and the United States, the world is divided. Those who cling to Donald Trump, the Republicans, the conservatives, um, and racism, sexism, and homophobia, they can't sever themselves from that to join us. But for the millions who wear Black Lives Matter t-shirts, right? And who claim to believe in equality, which I was mentioning earlier, who claim to love in the second great awakening where everyone is Protestant, we would just say, love Jesus. But for the millions today who just claim to love, they will be tested. And they can't just say, let's see, they'll be tested and the test will be that they can't just say they, they have to join this movement and they need every part of this message. So they'll claim that they love equality. They'll claim that they love Jesus, but they will be tested and they will have to join just like she joined the Millerites. They will have to join this movement. And they need every part of this message. So the shaping from this study was 2021. She's talking about the shaking that happened last year, it'd be 2019. So that shaking was not seen. The, the people did not see the transition here from the New School to Millerites. And in the previous dispensation and that shaking in 2019, 2018, 2019, they did not see the transition. Um, from the new school to the Millerites, they didn't see the transition in our history. They thought that Michael Moore understands. They could learn from Michael Moore in the world. They thought that Hollywood gets it. They thought a liberal atheist world gets it. And if they claim, though, to get it, if they really claim to get it, what will they do? Join us. Join us. If they really claim to get it, they will join us. So they needed to accept every single thing back in this history on that chart. So those in the new school, they had to accept everything on that chart. They were given the 2300 day prophecy. You, you love Jesus. Here's the 2300 day prophecy. You have to accept it. People have thought the world is so much better than this movement. You know, those that thought that Michael Moore gets it and Hollywood gets it, we can learn from them. The real atheists get it. The world does not get equality, no matter what slogans they wear on their t-shirts. So wearing the Black Lives Matters t-shirt is not a ticket to, um, does not prove that they get equality. So in the Millerite history, if someone said they loved, they were tested with the chart, they looked at the chart, but they didn't see love in the chart. Is the love in the emotion or is the love in accepting the 2300 day prophecy? Accepting the prophetic message. Accepting the prophetic message. So they would say emotion, but we would say prophecy. The love is in the prophecy, in understanding prophecy. So we are faced with the same issue. Can people see love in the vows? What were some of the people doing um, 2019 to 2021 when it came to the vows? 
they were saying that there was no love in the vows. Yeah. And then so they were fighting. Free. Yeah. Was somebody else going to say something? Just that they were fighting against them. Okay. So many can't see it, um, but the love is there. The love is in the vows, just as the evidence of the love was found in the 1843 chart back here. So, um, so you have old school death. New school life, but only if you make the transition to become a Millerite, because what they claimed had to be tested. They claimed to love Jesus, and it had to be tested. They had to accept the prophetic message. So people externally who appear to be on the right side today will be tested. Right side meaning correct side, not the right. But the people that claim to be on the correct side will be tested. So um, what about the Lincoln Project? Who and what is the Lincoln Project? Or what is the Lincoln Project? Yeah, who? We've all heard of that, haven't we? The Lincoln Project? You're talking about the, the people that put yeah, ads on YouTube and all that against Trump? And Trumpism? Right. Who are they? Not individually. Who do they represent? Right. It's a, uh, I think it was like a, um, I know his name is George and, and, and Trump's, uh, one of Trump's uh, speakers or whatever they, whatever she was. The husband. Actually, yeah. Mary Ann Conway. Um, Conway, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So George Conway, and what political affiliation is he? He's in Southern Republican, Southern. conservative. Yeah, conservative. But, so the Lincoln Project is Republicans that now attack Trump and the Republican Party. And you might think that they are in the new school, right? Their methods in the treatment of people they disagree with, her words, were, are disgusting. So, and they claim to love. It's not enough to be Andy Trump or wear a t-shirt. Coming to the Sunday lot, everyone will be tested. I think about it as, I don't know how to draw it out, so I'll just try to explain it. And we, we saw this in that document that we read about Israel, I remember the name of it, but, um, God is love. I don't know how to draw this out. I'm not good at this stuff, but the God is love, right? So you got these people, all these different people that claim to love. But there's always like there's a group that they don't love, if that makes sense. Maybe somebody can say it better than I can. So we love, but we don't love you. We love, but we don't love you. You got white Christian nationalism that doesn't love a whole lot of groups. And what did we see with the liberal side? Some of the liberal side, as we continue through the Vesper classes, what do we see through them? Some of the liberals, liberals are anti-Semitic, right? Yeah, hating the Jews. Hating the Jews. So, so while God is love, and they claim to love, but they keep a group or two or 10 or 20 groups, however you want to, whatever, whoever you are, you're going to hate anybody. Are you going to be able to pass that test of equality? No. Because equality does what? God is no respecter of mankind, human humanity. Is impartial. Right. And if we're to reflect God's image, then we should be the same. Yes. Not, not claim the love, but have the LGBTQ community doesn't get their freedoms and rights. Women don't get their freedoms and rights. You've got, is somebody sharing screen? I think that's what somebody. Okay, that's what you do. Okay. 
So you've got um, singling out the LGBT, singling, singling out women, singling out the Jews, right? All these groups that they hate. So going back to how the Christian, how the Constitution became Christian, the document, Jared A. Goldstein says in the in the introduction that he's tracing the Constitution from being a godless document here, the first history, to be in the highest expression of Christian identity here. So the document, the pagan document here, and he's tracing this history to how it comes goes from a godless document to um, the highest Christian identity in our history and how that perception changed over three specific movements, how that perception changes in those movements. Um, how that perception changed over those movements and how these three movements all follow the same pattern. That pattern is what we want to look at. What is, anybody remember what that pattern is then? This first movement, what do they, what do they see? Uh, Susan says group threat. Yeah, group threat. Perfect. They see a group threat. And so when there's a group threat, there's going to be some people that are going to panic. What did we call, what did she call the people that panic in the last couple of studies? We talked about last night and then in the study that I did last week. What did she refer to them as? Anybody remember the word? You have a group threat that threatens. You mean prototype or the epitome? Yes, exactly. The, the, the prototype or the epitome. The perfect example of a US citizen, the Christian white national citizen, right? So the prototypes start to panic and they form, start to form a nationalistic response. They make demands on the Constitution and that this is true for each history. There's a group threat, there's a nationalistic response and they make demands on the Constitution. And we see that in each one of these ones, but we, what we see here is that the Constitution is already, in their eyes, interpreted as Christian. So in the document on page 267, he lays out the threat. So we see that this is where Ellen White stands, right? And who does he say the threat is? That Protestantism is responding to. Who's the threat? Jews, Catholics, Seventh-day Adventists, and the free thinkers. I won't read them. And the three thinkers are the threat, right? So that's the threat. And now they're going to um, form a nationalistic response to make demands on the Constitution. So in 1888, would they have elected a Catholic president? No. No because Catholicism is a threat, right? So coming, coming through who they consider to be the Catholics being uh, dirty Irish immigrants, remember we read some of that in some of those A.T. Jones documents as well. Um, if I remember right, they liked the people that came from the, maybe somebody remembers the words, right? You, the Norwegian, the white. The uh, Nordics. The Nordics, yeah. Um, but these Catholics, the Irish Catholics came in, were dirty and poor, and they didn't want them in. So, but is um, so many, especially Irish, were coming into the country. People were afraid because Catholics are saying we don't want to send our Catholic children to a state school or a public school and have our children taught your version of Protestantism. Jews and Adventists and free thinkers were all saying the same thing. So they didn't want the, their children to be going to these 
Protestant schools being taught their Protestantism. So these four are the threat in this history. And they weren't hiding it either. Um, and the document goes through that, that they felt threatened. So we know that they want to amend the Constitution, right? And they want to, what else? Pass the Sunday law. Pass the Sunday law. Okay. So looking at the free thinkers just for a minute as one of these groups, um, she mentioned two Wikipedia pages to look up free thought. And I know I did at the time, uh, maybe a lot of you or all of you did too. And then the golden age of free thought. So she suggested looking at free thought and the golden age of free thought. So the golden age was around in the eight, late 1800s, began to be more formalized in 1870s. And a couple of um, famous orators or speakers, one Robert G. Ingersoll, so they were becoming, the free thinkers were becoming more influential in this history um, and of Protestantism, and Protestantism was feeling uh, threatened. And what the free thinkers thought was the following, up to now all of it sounds positive, doesn't everyone want to be a free thinker? So being a free thinker, being able to think on your own, and that's what we talked about back here, being able to reason and think for yourself, you needed to be able to do that to make that transition to the Millerite. So the free thinkers actually sound like um, a good thing, right? So, but this is something that they would say. I would say anything that I believe cannot be because of an authority. So I'm not going to believe anything because of an authority, tradition, revelation, or dogma. It can only be based on logic, reason, and studied evidence, empirical observation. So that's what free thinkers um, believe. They're not going to accept anything based on authority, tradition, revelation, or dogma. It's going to be on reason, studied evidence, and empirical observation. And so this particularly applies to religious teaching. When they say they cannot believe something based on authority, revelation, they do completely away with the concept of inspiration. So like the Bible um, is written by a man, and it says things about history, but if you can't prove a king existed, but the king is mentioned in the in the Bible, right, then to them, then the king didn't exist because they're not going to believe what the Bible says. And this had recently been empowered by a particular book written by Charles Darwin, this, this thinking, um, by a book by Charles Darwin that seemed to give them logic, reason, and empirical observation. So they transformed over time. Back then, the free thinkers were mostly agnostic. Today, some are agnostic, but most are atheists today. Susan says it sounds, they sound like the new atheists. Like the what? Like the new atheists. Yeah, exactly. That's where I'm thinking of going. So they became atheists because they cannot trust in the documents that they cannot trust in the document documents they believe are man written. And it's particularly been influential through Charles Darwin, their empirical evidence. So it's a rebellion against any form of religious authority. So the free thinkers are a threat against any religious authority. The free thinkers are a threat. So um, so what do we need to do? We need to um, enact a Sunday law, right? So it begins with the issue of the Civil War. We went through the covenant history, um, the covenant church. The covenant is largely laid out in that whole enterprise. And they formed the National Reform Association in 1863. And as Adventists, we understand what that document was, or what, what was going on there with the National Reform Association. So after the Civil War, they restructured the organization and they go through a transformation. Between the end of the Civil War and 1888, they're seeing more and more of these four threats and they're mobilizing to oppose it. So you have two um, external streams of history in, the, in this history. To oppose the NRA, 
the National Reform Association, another association was formed called the Free Religious Association. So you have the Free Religious Association. And Adventist, Adventism stayed out of both of those, went our own way. So you have the National Reform Association is a response as an attack. Then the as a response of an attack, this group, the Free Religious Association, is rises. And it's all about equality. And Adventists don't get involved in this. Why? What did Adventism do later? Adventism do later. Why didn't they get involved in it? What did they create? A conference is that? Say that again. An conference, a general conference, or they have to um, uh, become an organization once they're, uh, you know, the sons to the civil war, is it? They're kind of going in and out on me, but I wasn't sure. So the official church was 1863, but later on in this history here, Adventism began what? Susan says create an official church. That was in 1863. Okay. Um, the, said, um, they were trying to keep the boys from going in the draft, from getting drafted. They did the Liberty League or the Religious Liberty. Remember that? Okay. Because we still see Religious Liberty and all their activities here. So by the time you get to 1888, what demands are Protestants making? What do the Protestants want done? We kind of have that answer already there. What do they already want? What do they want done? With all these this threat, what do they not want to do? Then the Constitution? And the Constitution and Sunday law, right? And we referred also already back to that A.T. Jones document that we read. A good document that goes through all that history of, of this fight that was going on and A.T. Jones' arguments on it. So they want to amend the Constitution and enact a Sunday law. So if they were just to enact a Sunday law, they're the prototype. They want to enact a Sunday law. The Sunday law is going to take care of who? Protestantism is the, is the prototype. So a Sunday law is going to get rid of who? The Jews and the Seventh-day Adventists. They will, one more. Susan says the free thinkers. The free thinkers, okay. So what happens with the Catholics? So the Sunday law is going to get rid of the Jews, it's going to get rid of the Seventh-day Adventists, it's going to get rid of the free thinkers. What about the Catholics? Remember, the Protestants are the prototype. This is the United States. Susan says they merge. The Catholics and the Protestants? Well, they both celebrate the same day. We can't hear you. Go ahead, say that again if you could. If they want to change the Constitution to reflect uh, Protestantism, then that'll right. take care of the Catholics. They want to call this, and that's what we read in that document by A.C. Jones, that they wanted to name it a Protestant Christian nation. Remember that? So they, they want to amend the Constitution to make it a Christian nation. But if you call it a Christian nation, that's still going to include this group. So I always like to think of it as like Satan being the dog that wants to mark his territory in the Protestant nation. So they want to define this Christian nation as Protestant, which gets rid of the Catholics. Right? So you need the amendment to the Constitution because the Sunday law gives homage or obeisance or worship to Catholicism. You can have a Sunday law in a Catholic country 
So they need to stipulate that we are Protestant, not Catholic. Their response is not random, it's calculated to directly take down who they see as the threat. Three of the four are taken down by the Sunday law, and the fourth, Catholicism, is taken down by the amendment to the Constitution. And when you have both, Protestantism is enshrined, the national identity is protected, and the prototype is secured in the document. So we're going to cover one more point as we are heading to the 50s here in more detail. But in the late 40s, it's post Second World War, right? And in this history, the threats are Christianity. Protestantism is on the attack of these four. The First World War, the Second World War, and many fascist organizations completely trashed the name of Christian through their use of it through the First and Second War. And the Christian organization became associated with fascism. So they made another calculated move. What was the calculated move here? They went from Christian to Judeo-Christian. Judeo -Christian, yeah. So they embrace the Jews. So the Jews are no longer a threat after the Second World War because no one would dare do that. <clears throat> now they embrace the title Judeo-Christian West. They were arresting and imprisoning Jews back in here in, 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 this, in, in this history. And they begin to transform because the threat has changed. So can they have a Sunday law now? So can there be a Sunday law in this history? No. 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 So the response, so you have a different threat, right? So the response has to be an attack on the threat. The minute you change who the threat is, you have to change your method of attack. So a Sunday law is not going to work in this history. You need to know who your threat. So who's our threat here? STA and the free thinkers. Oh, Susan says communism. Communism. Well, communism is the threat in this history. And now we're going to have Billy Graham rising up, who's going to link capitalism with Protestantism to protect the Judeo Christian West. And then, so capitalism. I didn't spell that right. With Protestant. Capitalism with Protestantism. And that was the McCarthy era. So the Jews are not a threat. So a Sunday law response will not do it there. There was something else that I, I picked up in some of the books that I've been listening to with capitalism. And I kind of want to look into it a little bit more to get more information on But capitalism is linked to patriarchy. Do you, if you have comments on that or um, understand that, go ahead and feel free to speak up. So I kind of wanted to look into it a little bit more. But capitalism is um, linked to patriarchy. Okay, so so Sunday law response won't work. Um, they brought in the Jewish community as an ally. You see the Jewish community as an ally in the same history, Adventism is no longer a threat. So Adventists aren't a threat because Sunday law is not going to happen there, so they so they can keep doing what they're doing. Um, and first of all, there is no Sunday law. If the Jews can keep Sabbath, we can keep Sabbath. So if the Jews can keep Sabbath, then the Adventists can keep Sabbath. So there's no problem there. There was something else that happened in here with Adventism. Anybody remember? Yes. So they they were viewed as a cult. Right. 
And so, because they didn't want to be viewed as a cult, they went over to the Protestantism side. Right. So in that same history, we were so afraid of being called a cult because of these people religiously following Calvin, it, Calvin accused us of following Ellen White. So they saw, you know, us following Ellen White, called it the cult. We didn't like that. So we're heading into the second and third generation, prophetically speaking, the fourth generation, the sins of our fathers. So the Judeo-Christian West, the Jews are not a threat, and the Adventists are not a threat. Catholicism is transforming. Communism is a threat. So it's a different threat. So you're going to have a different response. So yeah, the, the, they joined the Protestants. So they're no longer a threat. So between 1950 and 1979, there's three movements in this history, right? And those three histories are coming up in another study, but what were these three movements here in this history? Anybody have it? In the 1979 history? In the, between the 50s and 1979, three movements. Oh, the three movements, you mean the uh, feminism? Uh -huh. uh, Stonewall? I'm going to put it in order. You're doing that order. I'm going to put it in order. <laughs> okay. And civil rights. And civil rights. So those movements are coming up for another presentation. So this camp meeting that we've been reviewing, she went through different subjects, but all the subjects are linked. Um, externally, the Protestants believed that they are the prototype and it leads them into racism, sexism, and homophobia. So they believe that in, in our, our history that um, they're the prototype which leads them into racism, sexism, and homophobia. Today, the fight against sexism in this movement has faced opposition of the concept of the prototype. What was the prototype that we discussed that affects this movement? Internally, what's the prototype? Deepest bull? Yes. Define that. What's heaven? What, what's, the, what's the prototype of heaven? Uh, male. Male, male, male. Everybody's, everybody's male. Yeah. Yeah, they're all male. And so you have that mindset and that prototype that the male is the patriarchy, the hierarchy, the power, the 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 one in charge, all of that. So we looked at the nature of heaven, the Godhead, Lucifer, the angels, six thousand years of progression, documented in the Bible, sixty-six books that are all written by men, written to men, um, documenting that sexism has pervaded humanity for the last six thousand years. So sexism pervades humanity for 6,000 years. What should we see? That word that was in the beginning of the study. What should we see? What should we see from this history on the Constitution to this history? Transformation, right? So we should see a transformation. So you can see it clearly between the beginning and the end of ancient Israel. Here and here. But as our written inspiration ends here, um, that would be this one, the written inspiration ends here. We have to be willing to see that our transformation has not ended here. We see sexism in the beginning. We need to see the sexism end, the change at the end, and it didn't change here when inspiration ended. 
So there should still be for work to do transformation. And we're in that process. So you can see externally, the old school of Hodge and Princeton that rejects that. That's why they are the stream that carries the danger. And that's why it's the Falwells, Jerry Falwell, not liberal um, Clinton and Biden that enacts the Sunday law. So we see the one that's gonna enact the Sunday law would come from that conservative side. Adventism by and large falls into the wrong stream. They didn't make that transition. God has given us the structures at the end of the world that will teach us the history from 1798. Here's these three structures that are going to teach us from 1798 all the way through. And the history of Catholicism, Protestantism, and Adventism. We're focusing on Protestantism because we want to understand the funding law. So the focus has been in these studies to understand um, the funding law. But remember that while we were here, in I think it's February of 2019, where we are today is digging in and seeing the breakdown of the right wing of Protestantism, just a small port portion of that. So we're seeing that the Sunday law issue is a lot bigger than just Protestantism. So we're tracing the fundamentalism and the liberalism. And it's not enough to be an external liberal. That will be that will be tested. So it's not enough to just be an external liberal because that's going to be tested. So there's three movements in Protestantism, each trying, each trying to force their identity onto the nation because they see their identity threatened. In this history, Ellen White, these four threats here, right? So she said the movements are in progress. To, and it would amend the Constitution and enact the Sunday law, destroy the threat. Yeah? Were you going to say something? No? Okay. Somebody has a mic open, probably, that's not supposed to be. Or you can open your mic if you need to say something, but don't. But it's not, it's not. Okay. So these four were the threats, and Ellen White says, she says these movements are now in progress. And it would be to amend the Constitution and enact the Sunday law to destroy the threat. So we focus on ourselves, but we also are, are one part of that. They had some successes, but they largely failed. You can see that there's a history of failure um, in there. So post Second World War, there's a new threat. And the threat we saw was communism. They look at the threat and divide, define it in nationalistic terms. The city on a hill. Um, against a godless communism so the United States against the godless communism. So the threat changes, and therefore the response changes. So no longer are the Jews or the Adventists a threat, right? They embrace the Judeo-Christian. Um, the, the Jews taken in as allies. The Adventists um, pretty much join the Protestants, so they're no longer a threat. And it's just a stepping stone between the first movement and the third. This is a stepping stone from the first to the third. So we go through this transformation of being the threat, trying to amend the Constitution and enact the Sunday law. The threat changes, and it's now communism. It's not the Jews, and it's not the Seventh day Adventists. They've joined, joined the Protestants. We embrace the Jews. Um, and then, then this all then is just a stepping stone to the third history. So by the third, we're practically part of the ad, of part of them as an Adventist structure. That's why Adventism falls at the Sunday law. They gave up their identity in the 50s because they were afraid of being called a cult, because they followed a person, Ellen White. They were accused of being a cult for following her. They stop being a threat, and no matter how many times the conservative Adventist preaches against the Sunday law, they have joined and walked in step with the daughters of Babylon. They can't see that they're on the same side. So it's a different threat in our history now. So there's a different response. And we're in a history when we're starting to understand what that will be. But it all comes back to the subject, what subject in this history.
But in our history? Yeah. Gender? Gender. Yeah, that quality? Quality, yeah. Yeah, the quality. Gender. As we we'll continue to grow and define it, gender equality. Okay, that's all of that. Any comments before we? Before we pray, that's an excellent study. Thank you, Elaine. And uh, earlier, uh, I think Susan put in the chat the question that you were asking about patriarchy and capitalism. Yeah. Yeah, she put a couple of things in there that I'll have to. Um, I think what I'll do is open them right now so that I have them. Yeah, because I, I, I know that comes up in a, in one of the books that I was reading to link the two. Okay, anybody else? We can go ahead and I'll go ahead and go through her prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for how you have led your people. We see so much love in what you have done. May we understand what love is. I pray that we will see it in the messages and in the vows of this movement, even in what we might not have imagined is love. We've reached the end of this camp meeting. I pray that people will be blessed as they contemplate on what was taught, that you will help our thinking to transform, that we might think and see as you think and see and treat each other accordingly. You know the civil war that goes on in this movement for equality. There are so many vulnerable who are told what we teach incorrectly by those who misunderstand, misunderstand or oppose us. We pray that you give people a clear understanding of what is being taught, a clear understanding of the structures and the line that especially the vulnerable will be able to see and hear and accept. I pray that we will all see our personal need, make an effort to have that upper room experience of uniting with each other. We're looking out at the movement and see that only comes with equality, only that is causing unity. May people not just accept, but may they practice. So we place each member in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. So now we know though that we have progressed to see that it's beyond Protestantism. The issue is beyond Protestantism, that it um, and understanding culture. So um, Christine's going to pick up where we leave um, off from here. <laughs>